For those of you that don't know Bill, Bill has been a longtime uh, uh, friend of ours and of the division. Uh, uh, he's an osteopathic physician that uh, makes um, biomechanics and manipulative medicine uh, an art and a science both. And he's known across the country uh, for the work he's done in this area. He, he just got done uh, uh, with a book that he's been laboring on for, for many years. Uh, so Bill came here as an osteopath. At the time he came here, you know, we, we no osteopaths. So, uh, we have one or two sprinkled around here now. So, uh, <laughs> but he, uh, he, he began volunteering with us and then working with us and expressed an interest in uh, joining the faculty. So, um, you know, when I tried to see about having him join the medicine faculty, they loved him, but uh, uh, they didn't see it. So where does he join the faculty? He joins it in orthopedic surgery, the last place that you can ever imagine that an osteopathic physician uh, would be accepted. But Bill is so good in what he does and so unique in what he does and such a good communicator and a practitioner uh, that he was brought on faculty here. And uh, he was a really important part both of our division and of the arthritis center. Uh, he's given unflailing support to us, uh, uh, been very kind to us over the years, and he continues uh, to make uh, visits here, and it will be more often now because he's got a house here that he's moving into. Uh, so he comes from Kansas City, and uh, he doesn't want me to say Kansas City, Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> I live in Missouri. <laughs> Can I add just a comment? Please, yes. Oh, he's also helped many of us. So. Well, I can name three of our faculty, famous faculty, who, who to this day, one is deceased, but to this day, claim that Dr. Brooks was the best physician we had because all three of them, surgery was not an option, medication was done, and there was nowhere for them to turn except to build. And rheumatology sucked too, you can say that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he's a dear friend and well, welcome. And likewise, Bill. thank you. Well, first of all, thank you Dr. Quo for having me. It's a great honor to be here again. And thank you Dr. Gall for those kind remarks, Dr. Cap. And for those not present, Dr. Volz and Dr. Peltier and all of the faculty who welcomed me here 27, 28 years ago. And currently, <clears throat> I'm in private practice in Kansas City, Missouri. I hold a, the title of a research scientist at the Andrew Taylor Still Research Institute in Kirksville, Missouri. And I'm here today to share some perspectives that I've gleaned over these 36 years of practice, most of which have been devoted to caring for people with musculoskeletal pain syndromes, usually chronic, usually multi-regional, that had defied other diagnosis and care. Is there anyone here who hasn't heard that we're suffering from an opioid epidemic? <laughs> For those of us who've been around for a few decades, we've seen this problem wax and wane over the years. I think if we're really honest with ourselves, we recognize that that epidemic is due to many factors, but one of which has been the change in medical culture in the last 20 years in which we sought to acknowledge there were a lot of people in pain who needed compassionate care. So the prescription of opioids went up, and now there is a tension between the pain management practitioners in our profession and the addiction management practitioners. And this problem goes back and forth over the decades. But the real problem is pain. 
we haven't gotten to the bottom of why people are in pain in the first place and found ways to address that. In fact, this audience knows that we have more than just an opioid epidemic. We might even say we have an analgesic epidemic. When we're just treating the symptoms and not the causes, that's a first step, but all of us know about the morbidity and mortality associated with even over-the-counter analgesics, let alone opioids. So we might say we have an opioid epidemic, but pain is endemic, and a good portion of that are due to organic problems that rheumatologists and neurologists and orthopods appropriately address. But there's a huge number of people that have nonspecific pains, or even if they're localized pains, there's no known cause for them. And with the aging population, this is becoming an increasing problem. So it's incumbent upon us as a medical community to keep searching hard for the causes of musculoskeletal pain and to try consequently to find ways to not only relieve it, but actually resolve it and hopefully ultimately prevent it. So I think that's our obligation. And what my colleagues and I have been working on for these decades is an attempt to answer that question. It's by no means a panacea, but I think the paradigm I'm going to present to you today has the potential to fill a vital niche in that process. I'd like for us to take a few moments to think about the history of science and medicine over the last couple hundred years. A little more than 200 years ago, our founding father, George Washington, died of a sore throat, aided and abetted by his physicians repeatedly letting his blood. About that time, chemistry as a science started to coalesce with Lavoisier and Dalton's paradigm. During the next couple centuries, we've been able to use the science of chemistry to eventually develop biochemistry. Think back just when my father was born, we were just starting to discover vitamins, hormones, and so forth. And then, by the time I was born, the heyday of pharmacology developed in the early 50s. About the time of the Civil War, which was when my great-grandfather was alive, Darwin put biology on a scientific footing with the theory of evolution due to natural selection. The key to Darwin's work was not evolution. That was an idea that had been around a long time. The key to his success of his model was the idea of natural selection as the mechanism for evolution. Well, then coupled with advances in technology, in the latter part of the 19th century, we started to realize that germs were important <laughs> and that blood and lymph and the, what we now recognize vital functions of what we call the immune system were important. So biology mattered, chemistry mattered. Physics had come together prior to that. Galileo and Newton finally put physics on a scientific footing. But our appreciation for that in medicine kind of lagged. So we might say on the one hand, biochemistry matters, biology matters, biomechanics also matters, 
at least insofar as it's recognized in orthopedic surgery. But I think there's a big missing piece of that. And that's what the model I'm going to present to you is an attempt to fill. <clears throat> I think you all know that when there isn't a clear-cut rheumatologic, neurologic, orthopedic problem for people in pain, that people are treated either with analgesics or some sort of physical medicine. And both within osteopathic medicine and within physical therapy, there are time-honored traditions that can be lumped together as manual medicine. There are also, of course, the chiropractic traditions, the massage traditions, and there are a plethora of other hands-on forms of care that are used to address people with these kinds of complaints. In fact, we know that manual medicine is recorded in history as long as uh, three millennia ago. So it's been a l around a long time. It just doesn't go away. And yet, it's not well accepted and integrated into medical practice because it's not been deemed scientific. So if it has legitimacy, which I had an intuition it did have, or does have, and that's why I chose to be a DO over 40 years ago. The only hope we have for it readily, uh, really being available to the broad spectrum of patients is that we get this on a scientific footing. <clears throat> I've spoken with any number of uh, MD audiences over the years, and the skeptics are always asking me about where's the evidence. I'm not going to talk about the evidence today for two reasons. Number one, it's available in the literature to whatever extent it does exist. Number two, the research that's been done has not been done on the basis of what I consider to be a scientifically valid paradigm. I'm going to take you through a little exercise that I use with all my new patients. And for those of you who've listened to me speak before, you don't get to participate because you know the answer. <laughs> but for those of you who don't, I want you to all close your eyes for five seconds. Please, close your eyes. Okay. Now open your eyes, doctors. Okay. Now, here is your patient with a very aligned spine. Here's your patient with a not at all aligned spine. I want a show of hands to answer this question. The question is, which one is flexible and which one is rigid? We're going to focus on which one is rigid. So those of you who think this one is rigid, raise your left hand. Come on, folks. Okay. Which, those of you who think this one's rigid, raise your right hand. Okay. So you see we got about a 50-50 split. And since you guys are not on tape, I can risk embarrassing all of you because you're all wrong. Do you want to try again? Anybody got another answer? Well, you won't answer because I, as a physician, understand how difficult it is for all of us to say the words, I don't know. Think about this. You see, I ask you a question about how these potentially moved. I gave you no information about how they moved. All I gave you was information about what they look like at rest. So the test is invalid for the question that was posed. Now, insofar as that's what we do with our musculoskeletal system, which is move, it's a really important question. So all the practitioners of whatever profession that use positional relationships 
as a sufficient criteria for whatever intervention they make, whether it's exercise or any form of manual medicine, are pretty much just shooting in the dark. So the research that's based on those is very problematic in my opinion. There are a number of other examples that we don't have time for today, but I hope that dramatizes the state of the current thinking and some of the profound problems with it. <clears throat> so what we need is a new way of thinking. And if we look at the scientific and medical paradigms that have really taken root that we're all very comfortable with over the last couple centuries, there are certain values that are expressed in certain criteria that we all strive for. Probably the simplest example of this is Einstein's famous equation E equals mc squared. Because whatever, <coughs> whatever paradigm let me state that in other words. Science continually moves forward by trying to develop ways of thinking that explain the past and predict the future in the most logically consistent way because we want our way of thinking to have unity and not fragmentation. According to the necessary and sufficient criteria so that we can have the most complete and at the same time simple ways of thinking that make practical application the most meaningful. So E equals MC squared is certainly not logically inconsistent. It is obviously comprehensive and it's profoundly simple. One of the great achievements in scientific thinking in all of history. So as I describe this paradigm, which will not be any means, <laughs> by any means uh, 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 suggested that it compares to uh, Einstein's work, but the principles that uh, that work illustrated are what I'm trying to emulate here, including changes in some nomenclature that usually are what create a lot of the most uh, psychological resistance to this model because people are pretty deeply ingrained in their way of thinking and talking about things. So our nomenclature has to meet those criteria as well. <clears throat> so the title of this talk is The Functional Pathology of the Musculoskeletal System. And I want to talk about the word functional pathology and I want to talk about the idea of the musculoskeletal system as a system and then, in the course of that, we're going to do some demonstration of some of the principles about how we, base, we create an examination that potentially is valid. By that I mean it is quantifiable and reproducible and interpretable. I then will demonstrate a little bit of how this works after explaining the general idea of clinical application and we'll have some concluding remarks about the relative safety of this uh, field of medicine. So <clears throat> we all recognize the idea of functional pathology when it comes to the cardiovascular system. We know there are all kinds of organic lesions that cause cardiovascular problems, anatomically based, histologically based, and biochemically based. But every primary care physician every day deals with cardiovascular problems for which there's no anatomic, histologic, or biochemical lesion that's been found. And billions of dollars have been spent trying to find them. This manifests as idiopathic hypertension and idiopathic dysrhythmias. Well, the cardiovascular system is a muscle system. All it does fundamentally is move our blood around inside us. 
musculoskeletal system is a muscle system. Fundamentally, what it does is move us around in our world and anything we care to push or pull with it. So you would think, by analogy, that there should be organic or structural lesions in the musculoskeletal system, which obviously there are. We break bones, we tear ligaments, we have inflamed joints, and so on and so forth. But you would also think that there is malfunction or functional pathology of the musculoskeletal system. And while the osteopathic profession has tried for over a century now to define that, there have been some problems in our efforts to do that. So that's what this model is going to address. It's an attempt for us to understand how otherwise healthy structures malfunction in a way that has clinical consequences. Well, what does that mean? Well, let's just take hypertension. Will, who's going to be my patient today, is a paramedic. Most of the time when he takes a blood pressure, he's worried about the blood pressure being too low. Because what that means is the, the system isn't doing its job. Oxygenated blood isn't getting to where it needs to get. Most of the time, a primary care physician, when a patient walks in their office, alert, otherwise, you know, functioning, they don't even think too much about low blood pressure, we're worried about high blood pressure. And when we diagnose high blood pressure, most of those people are completely asymptomatic and potentially very surprised to learn that they have high blood pressure. In fact, they might even be upset about it and say, oh, I feel fine, why are you guys so worked up about this? In fact, when I go out and run, my blood pressure goes up, what's the big deal? I'm not going to take those medicines, doc. Well, the problem is you're not running. <laughs> I took your blood pressure when you're sitting here. And it's as if you were running, but all you're doing is sitting here. That's the problem with high blood pressure. Hi hypertension is an overuse syndrome. The, mus the cardiovascular system is working way too hard for the task at hand. It's as if the system were running 24-7, year after year, decade after decade, and everything else being equal, it's going to wear out prematurely. That's why we care about hypertension. We all know about all the long-term structural and organic pathology that comes from that. But it all starts with the system working way too hard. So we put that in a little more scientific language, we would say that essential hypertension is a problem of the cardiovascular system working inefficiently. So that's a word that if you remember anything from this talk, I want you to remember that word because my definition of the functional pathology of the musculoskeletal system is the inefficient production of posture and movement. The DO in the audience knows that that's a little different than what he was taught and what's in the ICD now 10. And yet, I've been speaking with my MD colleagues about this for decades now, and it seems to be a very comfortable and straightforward way of thinking when we put it in that way. It's also very meaningful in the sense that it not only resonates with what we already know about other muscle systems in the body, but it fits with Darwinian models of biology. If, you know, you're in a competitive environment, and you can function a lot more efficiently than the other human being, the chances are you've got a better chance of surviving. Are there any questions or comments at this point in the conversation? Okay. So that's 
an essential idea. Functional pathology, I think, is real. I think we can evaluate it in a at least semi-quantifiable and reproducible and thus valid way. I'll get to the exam in a minute, but there's another big idea here, and that's the musculoskeletal system. All of us start out our medical training in the anatomy lab. And most of us spend most of the time with our cadavers dissecting the musculoskeletal system. It is voluminous. And from day one, the only way we can kind of get our heads around it is to compartmentalize it. And that has trickled through then the whole practice of medicine. We tend to organize the musculoskeletal system around bones and joints. We don't think as often about the interconnectivity that just a simple muscle like the latissimus dorsi provides. Is the latissimus dorsi a shoulder muscle, an arm muscle, a thoracic muscle, a lumbosacral muscle? What is it? So when we take a blood pressure, in the absence of other pathology that we're trying to sort out, we take it as a measure of how the whole cardiovascular system is functioning. We want to take, if you will, the blood pressure of the musculoskeletal system. We've got to appreciate it as a whole system. To define a system, three criteria have to be met. Number one, you have to know which components are necessary and sufficient. Number two, you have to understand the integrating principles. And number three, you've got to be able to define what happens as a result of all this. Those are called emergent properties. This could be a whole lecture in itself, but very quickly, we can list the organs, not the tissues. Remember, there are only four tissues. That's what our histologists teach us. But we can list the organs that comprise the musculoskeletal system. I've asked a lot of audience to list them for me. Usually they come up with about a third of the 17 or 18 that I can list. Only because it's a different way of talking about musculoskeletal structures. We don't typically talk about bone as an organ, and muscle as an organ, and joint as an organ, and fascia as an organ. But we can do that. We do it for all the other organ systems in the body. The integrating principles are basically anatomic on the one hand, which is the fascia that literally connects and interpenetrates everything in our body from head to toe. There is no place in the body in which it's discontinuous. And physiologically, which is the nervous system. Anyone who's raised a child or watched a sibling raise a child remembers that we come out into the world moving rather incoherently. And then if it's a healthy child, in a relatively programmed way, over the course of a couple years, all kinds of integration occurs from head to toe and from center to periphery. And pretty soon, about the time they're two years old, they're running around causing all kinds of mischief. We all know that this is an integrated system. And certainly, if we look at high performance human beings in art and athletics, we realize that just, for example, swinging a golf club is a head-to-toe phenomenon. And yet somehow in medicine we've kind of lost track of this. But we have to bear this in mind if we're going to evaluate functional pathology. So when we list these organs and when we put them together anatomically and physiologically, what we come up with is the human shape, 
human posture and human movement, which is distinguished from quadrupeds, etc. It's human. Any questions or comments about this big idea? Okay. So that kind of sets the, the uh, groundwork for what we're going to start demonstrating now and showing you how we actually examine a human being for the functional pathology of the musculoskeletal system. The first thing that I think will dramatize this for you is, Will, if you'd take your shoes and socks off. And your glasses, too, so that they don't fall off in the midst of this. Okay, and Will uh, came to visit me yesterday. I evaluated him for a couple hours, both history and physical. And obviously, I don't have time for that today, but I'm going to show you a few key things and do a little treatment that will hopefully dramatize this idea of, to put it in layman's terms, your nose bone's connected to your toe bone and vice versa. So stand uh, perpendicular to Dr. Cap right there. There we go. So, Paul, you're going to be the judge of this. I want you to make sure you keep your knees, quote unquote, locked, okay? And then we're going to start here and bend sequentially forward one bone at a time. Let yourself breathe easily. Let your arms dangle out in front of you. Okay, is that about as far as you can go, Will? Yeah. Okay. Now keep your trunk bent forward. Let your head and neck come back and see if you can go down any further. Whoa, that's pretty different, isn't it? Okay, bend your head. Bend your oh. head and come on back up. Okay. okay, have a seat. Thank you. <clears throat> There's actually research published in the Journal of the American Osteopathic Association in 2012 that demonstrates this phenomenon. What we just showed you was the ability of the trunk to bend forward depends upon the behavior of the head and neck. The behavior of the head and neck is a confounding variable for all of the forward bending that's been done either clinically and in research, and yet it's never been controlled for historically. To put it a little inelegantly, it shows your head's connected to your rear and vice versa. Forward bending isn't just about the lumbar spine. It's about the whole trunk, at least. <clears throat> so I'm painting, I hope, a pretty picture for you. And you're all kind of wondering, yeah, but what does this have to do with my patient with low back pain or neck pain? Well, I've spent 10 years working in orthopedic surgery groups about seven of which were right here. And I've listened to this talk on several occasions. Our orthopedic colleagues readily recognize what happens when they fuse a hip. Blacks, a little more vivid, okay. That's fine. Okay, some of you may think fuse a hip, they always replace the hip. Well, yeah, most of the time now in the United States, but throughout the world, hips are still fused, and there are a number of conditions still, even in modern first world medicine where hips have to be fused. So let's just say this hip is fused. Well, this really works. 
at least for pain, because there's no more hip pain, because there's no more hip. So in that sense, it's very successful. But 10 years later, not so much, because there's an extremely high incidence of frank degenerative changes of the ipsilateral knee, contralateral hip, and the lumbar spine. Clinically, radiographically, and pathoanatomically. Well, step back from this a little bit. What happens if your hip isn't fused, but let's say you've lost 70% of the motion here, 60% here, 40% here, 80% here, in Will's case, darn near 100% here, and here. And then up at the thoracolumbar junction, you've lost another 60%. All of which are asymptomatic. Well, after a while, what, what are they likely to present with? Dr. Dome, who couldn't join us this morning's residency partner, Brady Giesler, referred to low back pain as, quote, the black hole of orthopedic surgery. This patient is likely to have lumbar pain and eventually lumbar degenerative joint and disc disease because the lumbar spine, and we'll see this on Will, even though that's not his current complaint, is compensating for relative loss of motion at these other joints. So this is how looking at the system as a whole starts to have an impact. For those of you who are sports fans, and I think there are a few of you around here, you do have a football team, right? <coughs> Not anymore. <laughs> so if you just think about a football team and the 11 guys on the offense, you know, there's any given time, six or seven of them are supposed to be blocking. Well, what if a couple of the guys take a play off or several plays off? Well. First of all, the other guys who are blocking have to uh, try to pick up the slack, which they can maybe initially, but if it goes on and on, they start to have trouble. And eventually, what happens to the quarterback? Slammed, right? <laughs> so it looks like the quarterback has a problem. But the real problem started with the guys that were dogging it, who were supposed to be blocking. In fact, since they were dogging it, you know, they feel pretty good. So in this scenario, it's these joints that are not doing their job that are displacing the mechanical load, and then this is where the symptoms are. And we end up treating the symptoms rather than, than the mechanical context in which it occurs. <clears throat> So I hope that's relatively straightforward, and I want to show you some other principles here. We have to find a way then to figure out how the musculoskeletal system as a whole is efficient. So Will, if you'd come up here again with your glasses off. And uh, once again, Dr. Cap, you're going to get to judge this, so you sit right in front of Dr. Cap, Will. And <clears throat> scoot back a little bit. Dr. Gall and I have had conversations about the relative meaning of evaluating motion actively and passively. There are certain implications for different findings in the rheumatologic tradition. But remember, basically, the rheum you rheumatologists are looking for organic pathology. So we're asking a different question, and we're going to use different types of testing for different purposes. 
So I want you to sit up tall, Will. And what we're going to check is side bending of his neck. I want you to put your left ear on your left shoulder, your right ear on your right shoulder, come on back to neutral. And he's got great range of motion, right? So even above the quote unquote upper limit of normal. So he's like really limber. Or is he? Now, if I find what I think is the seventh cervical vertebra, and I push as hard as I can, that's about as far as he goes to the right. Yes, to the best of my ability. And now to the left. And you see there's a radically different set of information you get, right? Here's the trick. Turn around, Will, if you would, please. Sitting there. Yes. Yeah. Do you mind taking your shirt off? No. Okay. Okay, I want you to look at the rest of his spine as he puts his left ear on his left shoulder and his right ear on his right shoulder. And you'll see there's movement throughout the rest of the spine. This is compensatory movement. Did, did you see that, Dr. Cap? Do it again. Put your, yeah, go ahead and really move it. Yeah, you saw some movement as thoracic and lumbar spine. Whereas when you turn around, and notice that not only am I trying to fix T1, but I'm holding his whole trunk so that to the best of my clinical ability, nothing else can move other than his neck. Okay? You can put your shirt on. Sit back down. If the question is, how does his neck move, then to do a valid exam, you can only let his neck move. If the question is, how well can he put his ear on his shoulder, that's a whole different question. Well, what this, I hope, illustrates is that it's crucial to be conscious of what question we're asking, why we're asking the question, and then doing an exam that actually potentially answers the question. That's called validity. Now, which is the best way to examine Will? Well, that's a misleading question because they're both important questions. You see? It's important about how he can orchestrate his own posture and movement and get around in the world. That's a, val that's a meaningful question. But it's not the same question of how tight or loose his neck is. So if we're going to ask questions about how much motion is available, we have to be very, very exacting about what's moving and what's not, first of all. OK? And the broader question, uh, broader principle is that both these questions about how much motion is available in a body and how that body actually creates its posture and movement are separate but important questions. Now, because of time, I'm only going to focus on how much motion is available in his body at this point. <clears throat> And I want to show you how I interpret this information first, and then I'm going to demonstrate some basic things that you can all see in the room on Will. There are all kinds of subtle things that I can't show you. And then, with his permission, I'm going to start a little bit of treatment, so hopefully you'll see how this has an impact in ways that might surprise you. In um, traditional osteopathic medicine, the criteria for how something is judged to be functional or not is symmetry. So I guess you could probably come back up here. Have a seat. And since there's a DO or two in the audience, I think this is worth going into a little bit more. 
sit up tall. So for example, let's just take straight cephalic extremity abduction. In the orthopedic range, normal might be between 160 and uh, 180. As you can see, I'm bending his trunk there. So anything within that range would be considered within normal limits. An osteopathic exam would look at how he moves on one side and compare it to the opposite side. And you see he moves better on the left than the right. So we would call that a dysfunction on the right and use manipulative manual medicine to address that. But here's the problem. For all we know, before his injury, whatever it might have been, instead of 180 degrees, he might have gotten to 190 degrees. In fact, I bet a number of the young ladies in the room would easily go that far. So if all we did was restore this side to 180, he still might be tight. Furthermore, comparing this to this doesn't help us compare this to this, which of course, motion at his shoulder is a three-dimensional phenomena. In swinging a golf club, all kinds of things are happening all at once at the shoulder. Furthermore, for those of us who practice manipulative medicine, comparing this doesn't help us compare it to this. I mean, comparing this to this doesn't help us compare it to that. So there are a lot of problems, have a seat again, with <clears throat> traditional criteria in osteopathic medicine to evaluate dysfunction. We've developed a way that instead of having a one-to-one -one comparison, we now have a one-to as many hundred motions as you want to examine comparison. And we call this proportionality as opposed to symmetry. It's a three-stage process. The first is grading. The second is profiling. And the third is prioritizing. And not unlike what all of us do when we grade joint swelling, muscle strength, murmurs, reflexes, we have a semi-quantifiable scale that's been relatively shown to be intra and intra examiner reliable. Every movement pattern that I examine on a patient, I assign a grade to. A simple example of this would be what you might know as straight leg raising. In fact, Will, you can lie down here. On your back. Okay. So <clears throat> we start out with a somewhat arbitrary reference point of 90 degrees, because that's a high range of the orthopedic normal range. And in Will's case, that's about as far as he gets. So he gets about halfway. If he got this far, we'd call it minus four. If he got this far, minus three, minus two, minus one, or reference point. So every movement, whether it's the motion of a vertebra, or a bone in the foot, or a large motion of an extremity can be assigned a grade. You can just stay there. Yeah. Then, although this doesn't have a lot of impact for what I want to do initially with the patient, it does set the stage for how I want to care for a patient in the long run. Once I've gathered hundreds of grades of motion throughout the body, I want to stand back and look at, if you will, the forest for the trees. I want to look and say, is this patient basically a normal, everyday kind of motion pattern? Or is this a tighter person? Or is this a really loose person? In fact, Eric used to refer to me, some of his Ehlers, Danlos, and even Marfan syndrome patients. And at first you would think, well, that doesn't make any sense. What I do for a living is to mobilize people, and they're already too mobile. So why would he send them to me? Well, even people who are extremely mobile have relative hypomobilities. 
So I need to be able to appreciate what ideally a proportionate pattern of movement is throughout any given patient's whole system. And we get a perspective on that by just looking at the totality. I actually know, Dr. Miller, that this young man is optimally on the high range of mobility, even though within his body there are things that are just frozen, stuck. So if I were to have the opportunity to care for him to some completion, we'd want him to be pretty darn limber from head to toe, and that would be pretty close to proportionate movement throughout his body. The last thing I do is I prioritize, and what I want to know is what parts of the body are the tightest, what movement patterns in the body are the tightest. And then there's some additional criteria that I'm running out of time that help me further prioritize where I'm going to intervene in the system. But I will tell you that it's very, very rarely that I intervene where they are symptomatic. And this, of course, is very much at odds with what most of the current manual medicine research is based on. Almost all the research out there, if you got low back pain, they treat the low back. Not me. What I do is I find the, the real problem mechanical limitations in the system. So I've got a few minutes left. I'm going to do some show and tell on him, but I want to address any questions or thoughts at this point, if anyone has any. He has a history of trauma, including a car accident when he was 15 in which he fractured an orbit and lost consciousness. He sprained his ankles a number of times. He broke his left radius as a child. And he's been very athletic. Right now, he serves as a firefighter and a paramedic. So, and his recreation is very, very much uh, uh, exercise-based. So these pain syndromes are getting to have a pretty big impact on his life, both professionally and recreationally. And we're going to do everything we can to turn the clock back on this. You notice that I referenced a car accident 15 years ago. Because in this model, not only are we concerned with looking at people from head to toe, but we understand how these problems develop longitudinally. The body, when viewed, the musculoskeletal system, when viewed as a system, can sequester a lot of problems until eventually the system decompensates. It's just like a liver, you know? The drunk wake gets up one morning and is yellow and says, why now? I've been drinking a fifth of whiskey every day for the last 25 years. Why now? Well, he's been killing liver uh, hepatocytes all along. He just finally reached the threshold where he decompensated. And so we have injuries to our musculoskeletal system, and we have persistent dysfunction, and we compensate, and we go on until midlife in the 30s and 40s when things start to manifest as symptoms. Everybody with me so far? Okay. So I'm going to show you a few things that are most obvious in Will. We're going to look at motions at his hips. And <clears throat> so he really is pretty tight in medial rotation. He's got good modest loss of adduction and abduction. That's pretty tight on this side. And then lie face down. Now I mentioned that it's important that we isolate motion to the joint that we're looking at because if you do this, it looks like he's got great backward bending at his hip. But what was really moving was his lumbar spine. Because if I hold his pelvis, I can't move this. 
So the same principle that I showed you with the neck applies here. Another principle is, you see, in this context, all of a sudden, oh, he's got great medial rotation at his hip. Why is he tight when he's supine and not when he's prone? Well, it's a different mechanical context. So if you just examine someone in one context, you may miss the dysfunction in another. And again, on this side, I can't bend him backward at his hip. Turn your head to the right, and we'll look at some motions at his shoulder. You'll see that this gets this far on the left, and this far on the right. In my from my standpoint, those are extremely tight motions. Okay, so I've got 20 seconds left. <laughs> Lie on your back. No, actually, stay face down. So I'm going to proceed with some treatment now, okay, Will? Okay. All right. When I examined him yesterday, I found that he had severe loss of motion in his hind feet. And I don't have time to go into the details of what I'm doing, except to say I'm doing my best to mobilize his hind feet. Lie on your back. <clears throat> He also had severe loss of motion in his sacroiliac joints and his pubic symphysis. Bring your knees up. Push your knees apart as hard as you can. Really hard. And relax. Bring your knees together as hard as you can. It might hurt a little bit. And relax. Again. Come on. Push hard. And relax. Scoot up so your feet are on the table. Scoot that way. <coughs> Stretch your arms beyond your head. Stretch your way up. Breathe through your nose. Okay, so I want you to sit up and face Dr. Cap again. Let's get over here. Okay, so within the tolerances of clinical exam, I'm going to do my best to repeat this examination of his neck in exactly the same way I did it before. Pretty big change, right? Now lie face down. And again, as best I can. See the difference? Find your back. What I hope that dramatizes for you, including my DO colleague, is that I didn't address my treatment to his symptoms at all. After an hour examining him yesterday, I had honed in on what 
historically in osteopathy we called the key lesion, which was, is an archaic term, but we might now call the primary patterns of dysfunction. And by addressing those, there was a system-wide response. Is that organized by mechanical properties of fascia? Is that organized by the nervous system? We don't know yet. But I hope that dramatized for you how his neck bone, if you will, was connected to his foot bone. <laughs> I'm not done with Will, he needs to follow up with me in order to have a thorough and sustained response. But I'm pretty optimistic based on his history, his exam, and just this immediate response that I can help him a great deal. Eventually, he's going to have to maintain himself. I don't want him coming back to see me every two weeks for the rest of his life. I hope that I've broken down the log jams in his system so that with just simple stretching and some other forms of exercise, he can maintain himself on an indefinite basis. This, of course, contrasts a lot with what you see going on in the community from in the hands of multiple professions in which maintenance care is the norm. There are occasional instances in which maintenance care is indicated. I care for a woman with polio who has a flail right pedal extremity and so she's always overusing the other side and so that's an appropriate form of maintenance care. But an awful lot of the time it's really unnecessary if we really thoroughly address the dysfunction in the body. The last thing I want to comment about is the relative safety of manual medicine and osteopathic manipulative medicine. Adverse events associated with manipulative and manual medicine are simply anecdotal. And depending upon one's cultural biases, more or less important. But they're always important. This is true for every drug, every needle, every surgery, every hospitalization. I'm proud to say that in my work with the Andrew Taylor Still Research Institute, we are developing an infrastructure and have started initial studies to actually document the relative in incidence of at least osteopathic manipulative medicine. There are a few little nascent studies about other forms of uh, manipulation out there as well. When there are injuries, they can be serious. But on a statistical basis, relative to even over-the-counter analgesics, the incidence of serious complications from manipulation is minuscule. So my bias is certainly that this is where we should start, with physical medicine to address these non-specific pain syndromes. And when that fails, then all the forms of current care then become applicable. But I think it's incumbent upon us to work very hard to try to understand these conditions better and address them with comparatively safe and effective forms of intervention. So again, thank you all very much for your time and attention and for the honor of being here and sharing with you. Any questions or comments? Questions? Well, thank you. I think uh, we learned a lot. Um, certainly some different perspectives and a lot of food for thought. Appreciate your coming in. Thank you very, thank you very much. Welcome back. Welcome back. What, what are the resources in Tucson for getting this type of evaluation? There are a number of osteopathic physicians who practice manipulative medicine. I am sufficiently, it's been 20 years since I've lived here, so I can't, I can't condemn or condone any given practitioner. I just simply am not familiar with the community and not being able to do that. I apologize, but that's, that's the state of my knowledge right now. I guess a follow-up question, um, in some sense, um, and it's certainly true without medicine, without medicine, but in terms of manipulation, it would seem that, you know, obviously operator dependent and in terms of both safety and in terms of efficacy. Absolutely. But we've struggled with that with surgery for decades, too. And this is, we are in a primitive stage here. Even though manual medicine's been along for thousands of years, I hope that if I'm reincarnated in 200 years, I can look back and see that this was the start 
of a foundation, a scientific foundation, so that we can eventually put it on the same kind of footing that we do with surgery. There are limitations with surgery about how we do blinded research. And that's very much true with this as well. Um, it's very operating. It's, it's been very empirical, and it's a hodgepodge. And that's what I'm, what I'm really trying to address here is to, at least in terms of biomechanics, to find a universal way of thinking and examining people that makes whatever manipulative tool, in fact, pronounce your name again for me. Shark. Shark. Knows that there are probably 17 different models of osteopathic manipulative medicine, let alone all the chiropractic and physical therapy and et cetera. And of those 17, there are like eight different diagnostic models. And the students who go through these training programs, most of them are just overwhelmed and they don't know how to turn left and right and make sense of all this. Because there have been some conceptual problems. And that's what I've worked very hard to try to get behind. With this model, you notice I didn't put a plug in for any kind of manipulation medicine. If you can use this technique or that technique or say an incantation or you know rub a potion or whatever and you can restore motion at the joint, that's the key thing. Part of the problem is that manipulation I think for political and economic reasons has been categorized in a way that we don't recognize that it's basically a form of mobilization. All these things should be put under the umbrella of mobilization techniques. And rather than realigning the spine or reducing supplications or some of the other language, it's been based on an extremely limited, if not just plain wrong, model for the use of these techniques. Bill, and we have pushed Bill very hard, a few of us over the past many years, Try to put this down into the written word yeah. somewhere. It's so, so important because it's not available uh, to this kind of degree. And we're hoping that this will be finished in, in this current year. So I have drafted four volumes, uh, close to 200,000 words. So you see in an hour, I can really just skim the surface of the big ideas here. An introductory volume, which is very close to being completed, and then three advanced volumes that a more uh, academic audience will be interested in. So I'm about 90% done with the narrative of the uh, introductory volume, and then it just, you know, the business of getting it illustrated and referenced and getting it out there. And I, it's certainly a very high priority for me, and Paul has played a large role in continuing to kick me in the you-know-what to get, get this done, and I, I'm doing my best to respond uh, given my professional and family circumstances. <coughs> I haven't given up, I'm not going to give up as long as God gives me the opportunity to continue. So hopefully within a year you'll see an online version of an introductory model for this that's designed to complement a seminar for primary care physicians, although certainly specialists that, who uh, you know, want to get more deeply involved in working very well. Uh, and then eventually the more advanced books for, to really provide the academic gravitas. Very much part of the time.